John chapter 15 and verse number one. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you, except ye abide in me. So Jesus is saying you got to stay in the vine. You got to stay connected to the vine. Amen. You got to stay connected to Jesus Christ. He said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I am him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Amen. We can't do it without the Lord this morning. Amen. I want to talk for a few minutes <clears throat> about staying connected. That's kind of my title for today is staying connected. Let's go to the Lord and, and ask him to be with us this morning. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, Jesus. God, for your word. I pray that you would help me today. Use me, O oh Lord to bring forth what you desire to speak to your people. God, we love you. We're nothing without your touch. We can do nothing without you, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. God bless you. You may be seated. <clears throat> Abide simply means to stay, stay in a, in a given place. It means uh, in relationship and also in expectancy. But it means to stay connected, to be present, amen? I like that definition of it, to be present, amen? When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there, amen? But when the roll's called up down here, I want to be there too, amen? I want to be present, amen, in the Lord. It's first step really to holiness uh, when we talk about holiness and how uh, we, we need to be holy, the Bible says, as God is holy. Amen. I'm not talking about a standard of dress, but the holiness that comes within. And to be present is really one of the first steps to holiness. We find that in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. Be present. Come before him. Amen. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, if you do that, then you've done a great job, right? You've really rose to high occasions. You, you have really accomplished something in your life, right? No, it doesn't say that. That just says that's your reasonable service. That's the first step <clears throat> in your walk with the Lord is to be present, amen, to connect with him, amen, and to be present with him. James chapter 4 verse 8 says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Amen. So when we draw nigh to God, God draws nigh to us. And there's that, that's a continuational thing. It's something that we need to always to be doing is to drawing nigh to God. You got to stay connected. Amen. And for those that don't know, um, Brother Noe, uh, Barry Antos and I, uh, our Spanish pastor, uh, went to Mexico last week, over last week, and there's a, a work there that is beginning, and, and we were there, but as this was our second trip there, and it was a great trip, and so humbling to, um, those, those people are so pure and humble and hungry for the move of God, amen, and so it's a great thing to be a part of that. But one thing that I realized there were, when we went back the second time, there were a few people <clears throat> that weren't there anymore. And I was thinking about, you know, the parable of the seed and, and how that, you know, some, and we're going to cover that here in a minute, but, you know, it's so important to stay connected to your experience. It's not a one-time experience. Amen. And there was a young man by the name of, of Wilbert. And Wilbert was, um, he was just staying across the street from where we were holding services at a house. 
He never came to the services or anything like that. But we were leaving out on Thursday, Wednesday morning, I think it was. Wednesday morning, we were going to leave at 7 o'clock in the morning. And uh, as always, as it was over there, Brother Noe would say, we'll be getting up and leaving at 7 o'clock. Well, I'd always want to try to get up in time to be ready. And uh, so I'd look out my window at 6 o'clock. And there were the guys already standing out there, talking, wandering around. They're just so anxious to get the day going and to have the power of God moving in their lives. And this day was no exception. We're leaving at 7. <clears throat> now, it was a great experience. I loved, I loved going to Mexico and everything like that. But when, I, when it's time for me to get going home, my mind ch shifted. You know what I'm talking about? I'm getting home. I'm ready to go home. And uh, so I'm, I'm asking, Noe, okay, when's our plane connections? When we, when we got to be here? When we got, and he's just all laid back. He's just like, well, we, you know, we're just going to follow the presence of the Lord. No, <laughs> no, I'm not following the presence of the Lord in this. This is what we got to make our connection in. God already has this planned out. We don't have to feel nothing for this. We just got to know what our connections. But anyway, that's kind of how, I was, my mindset was, was to go. And um, so here we are, six o'clock in the morning. I look out, so I get dressed. I go out there. What's going on? Well, there's a guy by, out there by the name of Wilbert. And Wilbert had the, was going to take a bus from where we were to Vera Vamosa. And that was about four hours away. Well, he missed the bus, or the bus never came through. It happens down there. They just don't show up down there sometimes. So he asked the guy across the street, Esquardo, who is the guy that's kind of overseeing all this work that's down there. He asked him if he could get a ride into the city where Brother Noe and I were staying. Amen? That's where our hotel was. And that was about 20 minutes away. Well, in the process of that, this brother Esquardo, he's such a powerful witness. He begins witnessing to this young man, Wilbert, and Wilbert wants to know more. So at six o'clock in the morning, brother Noe and the guys, and uh, I'm sitting there, but I don't know a word they're saying because it's all Spanish. <clears throat> but I know they're talking about the word of God and Noe's given another Bible study on baptism. And Wilbert wants to get baptized. And then I think we have a couple pictures if you got those pictures. So there's, there's Wilbert and there I'm in the water, ready to go home, but I'm in the water at seven o'clock in the morning, amen? And thank God for it. <clears throat> Wilbert got baptized and he got the Holy Ghost in the water. <clears throat> And then, fortunate or unfortunate for Wilbert, we were going to the same city, four-hour drive. So he got to ride with us instead of taking the bus. But through that whole thing was a four-hour Bible study from Pastor Noe, amen? And so, and I just thought, you know, um, and there is a church in Veramosa, uh, Mexico. And so the important thing for us to do with this young man was to get him connected, right, with the church. It's so important. You can have an experience, but you got to stay connected. Does that make sense? So that's Wilbert's story and, and how he came about coming to the Lord. And it's just an amazing thing how that was just a continual thing. We would go to somebody's house and pray for them. And he, Brother Noe, I think he gave like eight Bible studies in 12 hours one time. And we would give him the word of God and he would, he would give him a Bible study on baptism and on the Holy Spirit. And they would either, sometimes they would accept it, sometimes, and so we'd go right then, we'd go to the water, baptize them, pray for them for the, get the Holy Ghost. I think we had um, 24, 23 baptized, 23 baptized in Jesus' name, and 10 received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> So many stories, so many powerful stories of just going house to house. You feel like you're reliving the book of Acts where they went house to house, sharing the word of God, 
and people were healed and touched and moved on by God. Amen? But the important thing, what made me think about this all too was like I said, a, a couple of the people that were there from October, we didn't see them this time, because you've got to stay connected. And even if you, you know, you can think of somebody in your mind that probably used to be coming to church here and they're not coming to church anymore. I mean, something happened in their walk with God where they didn't allow that connection to take place or to continue on, amen? It's not a one-time thing, but we have to realize that God desires a relationship with us, not just for us to have a good experience or receive a healing or receive the Holy Spirit, amen, but God desires to have a relationship with us. And so there are so many stories and, uh, that we can tell and it take the rest of the day to tell it, <clears throat> and I'll share a few more here as we go through this, but what's your story What's your story today? And I know that you're here today, so you are staying connected. But you got to be careful about how you stay connected. You got to be diligent about it. You've got to be conscious about it. You've got to make it a priority in your life to stay connected to Almighty God. Amen. And like I said, it reminded me of the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13, if you want to turn there. Matthew chapter 13. Thirteen and one, it said the same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside and great multitudes were gathered together unto him so that he went into a ship and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore. You know, it's so interesting, you know, like they were experiencing something in that day in the Bible day and something was happening. And so in these small villages or towns, whatever you want to, everybody realizes that something is happening. And we just had a service out in the front yard of this guy's house, along with the chickens and the turkeys and the hogs and the dogs and whatever other animal. They just all run around, all just run. And so I, I think I was trying to get a good count, but it was at least 100 people I think we had there on a Saturday night from a small village of... 800 people, you know, because they had heard something was going on. And this is kind of how Jesus was doing. He was, they were gathered together and they wanted to hear. And he went and sat down in the ship and the whole multitude stood on the shore. He spake, verse three, he spake many things to them in parables. Now a parable is an earthly story or an example that reveals a heavenly truth. And if you think about this, <clears throat> Jesus himself spoke in parables, it says all the time, he spoke this way, an earthly example where you could understand what he was talking about, a sower, a farmer that went out to sow seed, but you had to apply it to a heavenly principle. You couldn't just say, oh, that was a nice story about a farmer going by, and he had a prince, there was a principle, a heavenly principle about it. And Jesus himself, if you think about it, was a living parable, right? He was an earthly example of a heavenly truth. He was the earthly example of Almighty God. John 1 tells us that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And the Word, Jesus Christ, was made flesh and, beheld, and dwelt among us. Amen. And we beheld his glory, this manifestation of God, the glory as, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 18 of John 1 says, No man has seen God at any time, only the begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him, considered out loud. To consider out loud, declare means to consider out loud, to rehearse or to unfold. Jesus Christ was unfolding the fact that God had come to earth, amen, as a living parable, if, you, if we can say that, amen. 1 Timothy 3.16 tells us that without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, 
Jesus Christ. You know, the disciples, I think it was maybe Philip that said, Lord, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. And, and Jesus said, have I been so long with you? And yet thou hast not known me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen. And so he was the manifestation of God in the flesh. Manifest means to render apparent or to show self. God was showing himself to the world through the man, Jesus Christ. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. A parable was to give knowledge about a heavenly truth. God was showing, giving light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What humanity could see, the face of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.15 who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Hallelujah. Jesus was talking to his disciples. He said, I'm going to pray the Father. He shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him for he dwelleth with you. Jesus is speaking of himself. He dwells with you, I'm with you now, and I shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Even Jesus had a story to tell himself. He was the manifestation of God to the world. Amen? So Jesus had the story. When we were in Mexico, and you think about all their story, all of it was about... Uh, Trinitarian versus oneness. Uh, Catholicism, very prevalent in that area. And so none of them really had heard anything about the oneness of God. And especially in Jesus' name, baptism, <clears throat> there's no, I mean, you got to be not paying attention when you read the Word of God to realize that nobody was ever baptized in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. No one, ever, anywhere. Amen? They were all baptized in the name of Jesus Christ or in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen? And even history will tell you that the doctrine of the Trinity was established around the 300s and the early church always baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus or in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? So, but that's what, the revelation to them is as we begin to talk with them and begin to share with them the word of God. So it's that revelation is opened up to them and it's a powerful thing. But the difference, you know, that kind of brought them there, they said that they begin to hear that things were going on. It's the worship that we have when we get together. The power, we had a service on Friday night or Saturday night and we had another one on Sunday night and, you know, they get their guitars out and they begin to sing and everybody begins to worship. And it's the power of God, hallelujah, that doesn't matter where you are when you begin to lift up the name of Jesus. It doesn't matter whether you're in Palm Bay, Florida or in Mexico, hallelujah, you lift up the name of Jesus and God comes into your midst, amen. So that was the, di the difference was the worship. Don't ever underestimate the power of your worship. I said, don't ever underestimate the power of the worship. Folks, when people come into our church, they feel something different. Amen. When they come into the house of God and it's because of our worship to almighty God. Amen. Because all power in heaven and earth belong to him. And that was the difference that made them to turn their eyes and to see they don't want something dead and we, they, they, we don't have anything like this. We don't feel this in our church. Well, you're all used to it right now or you should be shouting right now because the power that we have in the house of God through the worship, hallelujah, and to realize, hallelujah, because we have been set free. It's not just an, uh, uh, something that we act upon because we know that it's good, but it's because God has moved in our lives. We all have a story to tell, amen? And as the old song says, you don't know like I know what God has done for me. 
So when you see me run around the church, hallelujah, you can say, well, there's a crazy man, but you don't know what God's done for me. You don't know that he brought me out of the miry clay, brought me out of the field of alcoholism, hallelujah, delivered my soul some 44 years ago, and I've never had any alcohol since. I've been set free by the power of God, hallelujah. And we come in, you all have your own story of what God has done for you in your life. And it's through worship that the world looks on us because there's something powerful. There's something else. And you can't get away when people begin to get healed and touched. And there was a lady there that got baptized and she said, I've had a stomach disorder, gastric disorder for 17 years. And she said, when I got baptized, I felt something happen in my body. And she claimed her healing that she's not been the same. She can tell that she's been healed by the power of God. Because God's a healer. And he's a deliverer. And Wilbert, who we showed the pictures there, he said he was laying on his bed that night and said, God, I don't know what else to do. I don't know where else to go. I don't know how else to respond. He, said, he was just saying, I have, I've given up, Lord. I don't know what else to do in my life. And the next day it got worse because he missed his bus. But God turned it all around because he met a man by the name of Esquardo that witnessed to him about the power of God and how God can turn around your life. Amen? So what's your story this morning? What is your story? Have you centered your life around him? Is it just an experience that you've had? Is it a feeling that you've had? Or are you connected to God? You're going to have to be connected to this. Amen? And I know I'm preaching to the choir here on the adult class on Sunday morning. But don't ever forget that you have to stay connected to God. Amen? The sower went forth. Verse in chapter uh, thir Matthew 13, the sower went forth. And when he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. Fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell on stony places where they had not much earth. Forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. Because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among thorns. The thorns sprung up, choked them. But other fell on good ground and brought forth fruit, some hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. <clears throat> he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus uses this parable. The, it's recorded in not only Matthew, but it's also recorded almost the same wording in Luke chapter 8, and also in Mark chapter 4. And I, went, I tried to compare the two or the three different uh, stories about the sower. And in all the cases, they had the same place where the seed fell, the wayside, stony places, thorns, and good ground. Amen. And in every one of the cases... Also, in verse 9, just like in Luke 8 and 8 and Mark 4 and 9, it always said, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. We can hear the word of God, and it can go in one ear and out the other, right? We can hear the word of God, get excited about it, but if you don't stay connected, amen, it drifts away. You can hear about it and you stay in for a while, but you're more concerned about the things of the world and all the riches of the world and, and all, the, all the troubles and heartaches in the world. They can choke it out. And that's why you've got to stay in connected, in connection with God, amen. But some fell on this good ground that brought forth, amen. And so we want to fall on the good ground. I was thinking, you know, Lord, what? You know, what is it that determines our soil? You know, well, when you look into it, the, the, of course, the soil is the heart, our hearts. And we have that belly. It relies upon each and every one of us how we process the word that we've been given. Amen. The disciples came to him and said, 
Why speakest thou in parables? And he answered and said to them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. And whosoever hath him shall be given unto him that and he shall have more abundance, and whosoever hath not from him shall be taken, even that which he hath. Therefore I speak unto them in parable, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in Mark, you know, I was thinking about, well, you know, how does that, how does that work, you know, and, and what is it the parable is not, the parable is not to hide the truth, the parable is to bring the truth out, right? Mark says a little bit differently at the end of his uh, parable about the sower. Mark says in verse 21, he said unto them, is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick? He says, you know, we sing that, my, let this uh, light of mine shine. I'm going to let it shine. Put it under a bushel. No, the kids sing that song, Right? But this is talking about this seed and that's being planted and what Christ is trying to reveal through this. He says, you don't take a candle and you put it under a bushel. You put it on a candlestick so you can see it makes a revelation. For there is nothing hid which shall not be made, which shall not be uh, manifested. Neither is there anything kept secret that it should not come abroad. If any man have ears to hear, you see how this is repeated and repetitious, let him hear. He saith unto them, take heed what you hear, with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall be given, shall more be given. So he's take, taking us, let's just look at this a little bit here. He's saying, take heed to what you hear, amen, and with what measure you meet. How are you measuring? How much are you taking in? How much do you want the Word of God? How much do you want the manifestation of God? It's going to be set on a, it's set out there. And all we have to do is to grasp a hold of it, this manifestation of what God has. Don't be satisfied with just going so far with the Word of God. It's like we want, we need to have more of it. We need to have measure out. We want to take, we say, I want all of it. And when we want all of it, God opens up to you the understanding of the word of God. Amen. Have you found that to be true in your life? It is true. It's the more you want. And it's an amazing thing because you never exhaust the word of God. You never, you never say, I've, I've studied it. I've, I've read it. I've done everything. And I know everything about the word of God. No, it just keeps revealing and revealing and revealing and revealing because the Word of God is God. And Jesus came as a manifestation of God to the Word. Amen? There's power in the Word of God. Amen? We say that all the time, and I know that seems a little elementary, but we can't stay away. We have to connect with the Word of God. Stay connected. And I was just thinking, I don't want to be the one that falls among the thorns, you know, where the cares of life and the riches of life choke out the word. Put the word first in your life. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. doesn't matter uh, what's going on in your life. Hallelujah. Follow after the word of God. Desire more of the word of God. We're going to have tribulations, right? We're going to have problems and trials and situations in this life. Amen. So we just have to continue to stay connected. Verse 14, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, by hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross. And that means, as uh, gross as means to be fattened or to calloused. He said their hearts were fat and or calloused, and that means it takes a process. You develop a callus on your hand over using it and using it and using it. And, and so when we allow the callus of the world and all the things of this world, we develop sometimes a callus over our heart. The hurts, the problems, and the situations, if you're not careful, they'll begin to build a callus over your heart and you become dull of hearing 
what God is trying to say to you. Amen? Does that make sense? They, uh, in their eyes, they have closed. Their eyes, they have closed. God's not closed your eyes. If you don't have an understanding, if you're not, it's not because God's closed your eyes, you've closed your eyes. You don't, we can all, we can all determine what we want to believe. Amen. Have you ever heard every, anybody say, well, bless God, uh, I'm not going to let any man tell me what to do, you know what I'm saying? Or, oh, bless God, I'm not, you know, I'm going to, I'm not going to believe that way. And I know that's how they teach it, but I'm not going to believe that way. You know, well, we all have that ability. We can all stop and get off wherever we want to get off. But God has revelation for us. I don't ever want to be that way. Amen. I always want to follow after what I find. Well, I can remember when the word of God was opened up to me <clears throat> and I'd gone to, uh, been in church, uh, went to another denominational church uh, since I was a young man, not faithfully, but I'd gone, I'd read the word of God. But when I began to open, when it was opened up to me, I just began to weep. I can remember uh, the man that uh, shared the word of God with me and Eric Claggett and uh, Kelly Woolheater. I remember their names, amen. They opened up and I just began to cry as God began to reveal unto me the oneness of the Godhead and what was going on in Acts chapter two, amen, because there's power in the word. And you can get off anywhere you want to get off, but I want to keep going into the word, amen. I want to keep connected to the word. God just keeps revealing himself. He keeps making himself known more. Amen. And we begin to grow in the Lord and we begin to produce. That's what it was saying. And when you begin to produce some 100, some 60, some th the fruit, the fruit in our life, it changes your life. Amen. It changes what you do and how you act and uh, how you perceive things. It's, it's the power of God's word. <clears throat> it says, but they have closed their eyes, at least at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart. And that's what it comes down to though. In the bottom, it's our heart. What's inside of us? We can get all dressed up and we can look nice. We can play the part, but it's in the heart what's in the heart. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Understand with your heart. Be connected with your heart and be converted and should heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men, Old talk, Testament men, have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. So he begins to explain to them then after that to them what the, the, what the um, parable meant. And he said, uh, when anyone heareth the word of God, word of the kingdom and understandeth <clears throat> understanding, uh, which denotes when you understand something, it denotes to consider not to necessarily have a compre comprehension of it, but that word understandeth means to consider. And you don't consider it, and you considereth not. You hear the word of the kingdom, and you don't consider it. <clears throat> then cometh the wicked one, catcheth away that which was sown in his heart, so that he which receiveth seed, so is he that receiveth seed by the wayside. He that receiveth seed in the stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and a nun with joy he receives it yet hath he not root there's no connection there right there's not connected it's just no root it's on the stony ground there's no root there's no connection in himself but doeth for a while for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word by and by he is offended amen so all these things are a process of our growth when we realize you know we're not going to let anything stand in our way it doesn't matter if we're persecuted, somebody calls us uh, weird because we live for God or somebody offends us even in the house of God, amen? It doesn't matter. I'm not here to, for your approval. I'm not here for, 
you know, and not that I, not that I don't care, but I'm just saying I'm here for God. Hallelujah. I don't care what the neighbors think. I don't care what anybody else thinks. Amen. I'm living for God because that's what I'm here for. Amen. And so uh, there's no root sometimes in our lives. We've got to stay connected to get into this, be a part of it, not just a, you know, a casual bypasser. He also that received uh, among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. They choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. He that receiveth seed on the good ground is he that bringeth forth, uh, heareth the word and understandeth it. He considers it, contemplates on it. You consider this word, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Amen. If you read on down through there, Matthew 13, 38 tells us the field is the world. So this word is being scattered across the whole world. Amen. And it was, uh, you know, kind of coming to life to me as we were over in Mexico doing that, spreading the word. It's, it's everywhere. People are hungry for this. Doesn't matter where you go. We have people here that are hungry for it. Amen. But we've been just so uh, increase with goods and have need of nothing. Amen. We don't consider anything. Those people over there have nothing. And thank you for your, uh, your eyeglasses and your donations and everything. Man, it, those eyeglasses are really something special to those people. They don't have eye doctors over there. They can't afford them. They don't go to them. But those readers, you know, really help them to be able to see better. Amen. But these people have nothing and makes you just want to come home and and sell everything you have and give to the poor, you know what I'm saying? But you're here for a few days and your mindset changes altogether. And once again, you're Americanized. <clears throat> God help us, amen? But we need to have a heart that just says, Lord, I want to consider your word. Consider what you're teaching, amen? Consider your word. What are you trying to say to me, amen? Amen? Is that how you pray when you sit down in your prayer time? Do you ask the Lord, Lord, what are you trying to say to me? Where do you want me to go? Or is it just petitions? Lord, I need this. I need that. I need this. I need that. I need this. How about just let's say, God, what do you want from us? My Lord, we have all that we need. Amen. But that field is the world, and the Word of God is going out into the, all the world, and it's how we respond to that <clears throat> is how we're going to grow. But we need to stay connected for sure. As in my uh, Bible, my yearly Bible reading, I'm in the book of Judges, and man, I was just thinking that's, that's kind of a depressing book, the book of Judges. You know what I'm talking about? Because these people, they, uh, they turn from God and Every once in a while says, and they did evil in the sight of God, and then God would come and rescue them, and, and then they did evil in the sight of God. I'm like, wow, don't these people get it? You know, don't they understand? <laughs> but the judges, and I was looking into it, but I think from the time of the death of Joshua and to the time of the first king, it's around 300, 350 years uh, time space in there where they had nobody uh, leading them and guiding them in, in uh, particular that God had given them these judges like Samson and Gideon and, and uh, some of the others that you know. But <clears throat> in chapter two, it kind of outlines everything about what these people did and what they went through. But I want to just highlight a few of the verses in Judges chapter two, verse two. Ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? You know what the word has been. You know what you need to do, but you've just not done it. Amen. <laughs> Why have you done this, you know? And so I'm skipping down to verse 10. And so they, they do good for a little while. And also in verse 10 says, also all that generation were gathered under their father, speaking of the leaders before them, Joshua, and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. So <clears throat> Joshua had passed away, the leaders passed away, and they all lived pretty well according to the elders that outlived Joshua even. They all did well. But after that, they had no relationship with God. They weren't connected to the Lord. They did not know his works. 
And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. They went serving other gods. They did other things. And then everything would turn bad for them and they begin to cry out. And, and verse 15 says, nevertheless, I'm thankful for a nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges. And all the mess that these guys were in, and you read through it, and they were in a terrible mess. God had mercy upon them, raised them up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. Verse 17, and yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but went a whoring after other gods. Verse 19, and it came to pass when the judge was dead that they t returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods, served them, bowed down unto them. This is a repeated process of doing better. God delivers them from their enemies than they do evil in the sight of the Lord. And then they do bad and they get captured and overrun by their enemies and they, they cry out to God. And in, however, God in his mercy comes once again and delivers them. And it's a repeated cycle. And it's just like, wow. Verse 19 <clears throat> helps us to understand a little bit about it. It says, and it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them, they cease not from doing their own doings. They cease not from doing their own, their own doings. And that's our battle, folks. So we've got to cease from doing our own thing, amen, and say, Lord, not my will, but thy will, amen. And from their stubborn ways, We've got to overcome this old stubborn flesh of ours, stay connected to God and what he's doing in our lives. So just in closing, we need to stay connected to the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, amen. You will, your faith will increase and stay strong if you stay in the word of God. And if you don't stay in the word of God, you'll lose faith. It, you, don't, you don't have the high mountain of faith, right? And you just live there the rest of your life. You got to continue in God's word. <clears throat> Look at Elijah, amen, had that great victory. And then the next day he was running for his life, you know, <clears throat> because we got to stay connected to what God is trying to speak to us. The seed was the word of God that he was spreading out there. Stay connected to the church, amen. Hebrews 10, 25 not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Stay connected to the church. I know you know that, but it's so important. I think about, um, <clears throat> I can't even think of what it is called now. 2020, what was that called? COVID? COVID. <clears throat> and we had to, <clears throat> excuse me. And it was easier for people to stay home. And um, I can remember Pastor Myers, he was just, when we'd talk, he's so concerned about the people. We wanted to try to connect with them, the ones I saw. I, saw, I was thinking to myself, and I probably even said, they'll be back, you know, as soon as the doors, or as soon as things get back going. And he said, no, you, you know, you start staying home, you get used to that, and you get comfortable. And, and sure enough, there are some that did not come back. They did not stay connected, amen? It's important to be a part of the church. I said, it's important to be a part of the church, amen? And this is what it's for. It's to exhort one another, amen? Have you exhorted anybody today? Have you tell them, told them you're praying for them? Have you told them they can make it? You don't know what they're going through, amen? Don't just run to your little seat and get mad if somebody's already sitting there, find out what God wants you to do in the service. And most importantly is, like I said before, is to worship God and to begin to lift him up. Stay connected. God wants you to have a calling. Proverbs 16, 1. The preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of man are clean in his own eyes, but God weigheth the spirit. <clears throat> Sometimes we don't... <clears throat> 
we can't even understand, right, what direction we're supposed to be going. <clears throat> we think we're doing the right things, and sometimes we realize that's not what God's will was. Verse 3 said, commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Amen. You start working for the Lord, find what you're supposed to do in the kingdom of God, and your thoughts are going to be established. You'll begin to stay connected. And of course, stay with the Lord in our daily devotion. Amen. If you don't pray, you won't stay. Amen. Don't fast, you won't last. Amen. Hallelujah. Stay connected. Amen. God bless you.